expectations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Be seated. Throughout the book of Psalms and uh, a few places in the book of Habakkuk, there is a mysterious word which has perplexed theologians and biblical scholars. It's the Hebrew word salah. Uh, and it's a word that has no clear translation, no simple translation in, into any other known language. Many scholars believe that it is most likely a sort of technical musical notation, something akin to a rest, a pause, a, a, a moment of interruption marking the, the transition from one artistic or emotional movement into another. And so, Salah is the quiet space between things. It is this concept of Salah that I want to invite you to carry into the season of Lent. This notion of pause. I, I want to use this as a sort of inspiration for what the work of this season is really all about. In the midst of our busy lives that are consumed by activity. Anyone feel like you have a busy life? Raise Just, okay, good, it's not just me. In, in the midst of these crazy, busy lives, Lent is a season meant to interrupt that busyness. It's meant to cause us to pause and reflect on these shifting movements, to be quiet enough to be aware of where things are moving in our life. Lent is a season to refrain from business as usual, to create space as we connect faith to life. I believe that through the observance and the practice of Salah, of pausing, that a fresh movement of God can lead us in new directions, though, though that may not always be the direction that we expect to be moved. In, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 17, the last verse of chapter 3, Jesus has just been baptized, and the chapter ends when the voice of God makes this glorious proclamation, This is my Son, whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Now, does that not sound like the beginning of good things? Doesn't that just sound like something wonderful is about to happen? They're powerful words of the cascading kind of love that, that God, our Heavenly Parent, has. It, it's this defining moment in Jesus' life, and one that on its face points towards immense blessing. Which is why it can be kind of difficult to reconcile that the very next words in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 4, verse 1, are these. Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. Well, hold on a second. That's a big jump from, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Jesus is led into the desert by the Spirit to be tempted by the devil. Doesn't say that Jesus stumbled into the wilderness. Doesn't say that he got lost and ended up there by mistake. No, he was led into the wilderness by the Spirit of the very God who had just called him beloved. This journey into the wilderness seems stark in contrast to the peaceful, hope-filled setting of his baptism. The sudden shift is a good time for Salah to pause and to consider the movement that's taking place here. Wilderness in the Bible is a theme that recurs time and time again, and it's almost always a place of testing, of, of tribulation, and this story is no exception. We're told that Jesus is tempted three times by the devil as he wanders through the wilderness. Now, in past sermons, I've, I've taken the time to focus on each one of those temptations individually, but, but today I want to I just look at this in a more general sense and, and just point out in a more general way the effect of those temptations. All of those temptations came upon Jesus in an isolated and seemingly vulnerable moment of his life, alone, 
in the wilderness, hungry, presumably tired. They were intended to challenge and perhaps even undo the strength of connection with God that we had just witnessed in the moment of his baptism. These temptations sought to sever that bond. Because while they were all unique in their approach, they all were nuanced, they were a little bit different, these three temptations. Central to each one of those temptations was a single question. Will you trust God to be God? Will you trust God to be God? And if we think about it, how many of life's temptations for us are rooted in that same question? Will you trust God to be God? But we don't like to talk about temptation. Not, not even in the church. You know, it's a touchy topic to say the least. I, I, I think there's a lot of reasons that we don't like to talk about it. It's, it's not the most uh, comfortable conversation to have, but, but I think at least part of us is afraid that we might have to start to get into specifics. And, and, and I don't think any of us want to do that. But, but temptation is this universal shared reality of our human condition and, and one that I, I think we should not be too quick to dismiss or to ignore. It's a hard reality, but it is a reality and it's something we need to talk about. We might benefit from practicing Salah here, from pausing to consider not only what temptation is in the abstract, not only what it is apart from us, because that, we, we don't mind thinking about temptation when we're talking about somebody else. I just don't want to talk about mine. But, but we, we need to move from thinking about temptation in the abstract to, 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 to creating space to actually think about how it manifests in my life. The Bible scholar Marietta Anschutz offers the following description of temptation in, in more detail, it's more specifics, it's, it's a more tangible thing. And, and as I read this for you, just think about if you hear your own experience anywhere in here. Temptation comes to us in moments when we look at others and feel insecure about not having enough. Temptation comes in judgments we make about strangers or friends who make choices that we do not understand. Temptation rules us, making us able to look away from those in need and to live out our lives unaffected by poverty, hunger, and disease. Temptation rages in moments when we allow our temper to define our lives, or when addiction to wealth, power, influence over others, vanity, or an inordinate need for control defines who we are. Temptation wins when we engage in the justification of little lies, small sins, a racist joke, a questionable business practice for the greater good, a criticism of a spouse or partner when he or she is not around. Temptation wins when we get so caught up in the trappings of life that we lose sight of life itself. These are the faceless moments of evil that, while mundane, lurk in the recesses of our lives and souls. Now that's a nice definition of temptation, and you may have felt some of your own experience there, but the reality is, I, I think uh, we all have our own first-hand knowledge of the reality of what temptation is. Matthew sets the wilderness as the backdrop of Jesus' encounter with temptation. The implication being made by Matthew is, is that out there, isolated, alone, hungry, thirsty, tired, it is a strategically opportune time to attack. That the devil has found his moment to tempt Jesus and to fracture his connection with God as the beloved son. And, and it makes a certain sense when you think about it. This moment of vulnerability. And yet the wilderness, with all of its potential for danger, with all the struggle and the challenges that are involved in wandering through the wilderness, 
it need not only be a place of struggle and challenge, it can be the very place where we discover God more deeply. The scientist Jane Goodall spent most of her life working with chimpanzees in Tanzania. She faced the challenges not only of a patriarchal system that questioned a, a woman's competency in the sciences, she faced also the dangers and struggles of the African wild. So dangerous, in fact, that one of her colleagues and friends, Diane Fossey, uh, who the movie uh, Gorillas in the Mist was made, made about, uh, she, she was killed doing the same kind of work in Africa. Uh, Jane Goodall did this work for 55 years of her life. 55 years. In 2010, she was asked, after all that she had been through, after all she had seen, all of the experiences that she, she had out there, all this time in the wilderness, in the wild, she was asked if she believed in God. A scientist, remind you. Uh, she was asked if she believed in God. This is her response. I don't have any idea who or what God is, but I do believe in some great spiritual power. I feel it, particularly when I'm out in nature. It's just something that's bigger and stronger than what I am or what anybody is. I feel it, and it's enough for me. I feel it, and it's enough for me. The devil in, in this story, the tempter, the, the, and these forces of temptation that work against Jesus in the wilderness, they, they have made a massive strategical miscalculation. They assumed that because he was alone and hungry and tired, that he was weak and susceptible. He was not. He had spent 40 days and 40 nights feasting from food, but fasting on the power of God. Jesus' sense of belovedness, his sense of his own belovedness in God was not vulnerable. If anything, it had grown stronger through this time. Jesus' life had been in a period of Salah, a moment of interruption which allowed him to actually absorb the reality of God's belovedness and to prepare himself for the road that he was being led down. He had been in the wilderness, and there in the wilderness he had experienced that great spiritual power of God, something bigger than him or any of his circumstances, and he felt it, and it was enough. May it be enough for us. As we take a moment to, to observe Salah, to pause and dwell for a period in the wilderness during this Lenten season, may we discover the truth that we need to be strengthened for what is next. Lent is about engaging the dark spaces in our lives, coming face to face with them, naming them, overcoming them, and being set free from them as God guides us down new paths. And so I observe you to, I, I'm sorry, I urge you to observe. Salah. Let God interrupt your life during this season of Lent. So that in whatever wilderness you find yourself navigating today, whatever wilderness you're trying to overcome, you may discover the God who calls you beloved. You may have insurance that this God will guide you wherever you need to be. And so that it will always be enough to know that this God is with you on the journey.